workshop tonight is being hosted um, with, in partnership with the media, uh, with the um, legislative committee. And I'd like to recognize, if you'd like to please take a round of applause for Amy B, Scott Miller, Brian Ferrard with ABC Nebraska, and Brad Stamen with Star Carroll. Um, so help me recognize the media for helping us with this. Western Nebraska Community College is providing the timers for tonight, and Scottsdale County is graciously providing the venue. Uh, just a little bit about the uh, government, governmental affairs. Uh, we do also uh, host the pre-legislative breakfast, which will be coming up on November 30th. And then we will also have the Le uh, Lincoln legislative trip in February, and conference calls with Senator Stinner uh, during the session. Uh, and tonight's moderator will be Kevin Mooney, and we'd like to thank Kevin for his two decades of service helping with forums and other news media in the community. So please give us a give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to start tonight. Uh, we have several forums we're going to go through. Uh, we'll do the Terrytown City Council Board two race first, and then the Scotts Bluff School Board race. At about 5.50 this evening, it'll run for about a half an hour, take a little bit of a break, and then the Gearing School Board will be at 6.30, and then at 7 o'clock we'll have the County Clerks on for about 20 minutes, and then at 7.30 we'll do the City of Scotts Bluff candidates. But once again, the first uh, particular form will be Terry Down City Council. We have Jerry Green right here to my immediate right, and then to his immediate right is Mike Minzy. Uh, these two gentlemen will have uh, 90 seconds for an opening statement, and then they have 90 seconds to respond to each question from the media, and an optional 30-second rebuttal following that, and at the end we'll have a one-minute closing. So we'll uh, start out with Mike. He gets the, uh, to start out with his 90-second uh, uh, opening. Well, I want to thank, first of all, the Chamber and also the media for allowing me to introduce myself to the voting public. I am Mike Menzi. I'm in my 43rd year at 1 Gary Street, and a candidate to represent Ward 2 you know, on the Terrytown City Council. Now, my wife, Lynn, and I have been married 47 years. We've got two children, 40 and 45. Both of them are also married with two children. Presently, I serve on the Terrytown Board of Health and as Terrytown representative on both the Tri-City Active Living Advisory Council and also the Chamber's Valley Visions uh, Committee. Now, 50 years ago this month, I went to work for Terry Carpenter Incorporated, then I moved to Terrytown in 1970. I've owned, rented, and lived on present Terrytown property at five different locations over 47 years. Previously, before that, I served with the Terrytown Police Department. I worked in the village of Terrytown for five years, was employed by Terry Carpenter Incorporated for five years, and then also I worked with the village in the city of Terrytown for 32 years as chair and clerk of Sanitary Improvement District number three. And currently outside of Terrytown, volunteers, treasurer of the Board of Oregon Trail Days, supervisory committee chair for a credit union, I'm on the Scottsbluff County Election Board. They work with friends of Rubidoux Training Post, Legacy of the Plains, and others. They've held various governmental entity positions of leadership from village to national level. I'm retired from a 46-year housing development career at Kaplan, currently working part-time at Kaplan, and am in my 40th seasonal year at H&R Block. All right, Jerry? In 90 seconds. I'm Jerry Green. I live in Terrytown and I've lived there for 20 some years. I'm finishing my third term on the council, or second term, excuse me. And I'd like to go ahead and uh, we've been going through a water project that's taking forever. <laughs> and we've had a lot of problems and we're finally starting to see an end to it. I'd like to be there that could see it finished. All right, the first question tonight will be from uh, Brad Stamen. Terrytown has, uh, well, first of all, Jerry, Mike, thank you for taking part in this tonight. Uh, the first question would be, uh, Terrytown has a number of vacant properties. How would you address handling these and the problems that come with them? Jerry, you're first. Well, we've had the, all these, these lots and stuff to clean up, and we've tried to go ahead and try to, uh, what you say, see if there's any hazardous waste or anything like that that has to be done. 
we don't have a lot of population and uh, we don't have a lot of income other than this property tax. We don't have the big sales tax or anything like that. And it's just sort of been hard to get someone to come in and, and look at it and really give us, we have the room to expand. Uh, I hope we can go ahead and work something out. But right now, our main concern is the water project and the sewer project. Mike? Would you state the question again? Is that a possibility? On vacant and... You, you have a, a number of vacant properties. They can, the just vacant properties. Right. And uh, how, would you, uh, how do you propose addressing that problem and the problems that come with that? Uh, most of the vacant properties that I know of, uh, I might mention that, we hadn't mentioned this earlier, Jerry is, uh, uh, is the incumbent, been on for some time, and, and I'm kind of trying to break in on this. The properties I'm aware of, most of those are mobile home sites, and they are under the control of an out-of-state uh, landlord, and uh, steps are being taken to, uh, you know, they'll fill those, clean them up, etc. Uh, that would be the case as far as the mobile home sites. There aren't much in the way of residential vacant lots throughout the community. Commercial is also pretty well filled. Anybody want time for rebuttal? No? All right, next question, Brian Sherrard. What are your thoughts on access to the Carpenter Center and one-way streets in the community? Mike, you're first. Go to me first. They uh, have uh, worked out a solution uh, in part for that uh, by one-way parking along Terry Boulevard. Uh, also, there's a possibility, as I understand, coming up on reopening an alleyway that goes between uh, the Carpenter Center and Michael Street. Uh, that comes with some, uh, some concern, but also it would quite possibly solve part of that problem. Uh, the Carpenter Center has become very, very, very successful, and much more successful than I'm sure they, they expected in the beginning when they were doing their planning and scheduling parking, uh, you know, directional access, etc. They're working on it, needs to do a little bit more, but I think we'll, you know, they'll make their way through it. Jerry? Uh, we went ahead and, uh, and tried to make the Carpenter Center our number one pro project there. And then, like I said, it's grown under uh, Bob uh, Nimnick, and he's really in, improved the deal. They, they built another gym, they've got a fantastic gymnasium class and uh, they we bought that they purchased enough the the, the, <laughs> the uh, housing low housing has picked purchased a lot that we're going to turn into parking for that and we finally worked something out hopefully this is like the third time that we've got something to try to get the traffic set so we don't have such big crowds and people have to walk so far. Any rebuttal? No. Okay. Scott Miller uh, with the next question. I'm just going to stop it, Scott. Um, of course, the water project was mentioned earlier. And one of the controversial aspects of it has been the metering uh, part of that project. Uh, what would you say to those who have a problem with the metering and how would you handle giving them feedback on the issue? Jerry, you're first. Right, we were having this problem. We've had it for years, and then we, our wells have went where they, we couldn't meet the standards anymore. But we had projects where, or beginning with the, the houses, people were irrigating every day, 24 hours a day, or even in the winter time they would be wintering, because you know, we didn't have any meters and no way to control how much we were using. And uh, the states are forced us into doing this. But we've had problems with. Uh, the, the meters, we've had problems with getting the, the financing and problems meeting the, 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 the what we have to do to make this work. And uh, hopefully we, we'll, we'll finish it up in maybe another year, year and a half. Mike? Uh, I think there's three phases on this water project, and uh, it's, it's been like Jerry said a long time coming, probably a 10 year thing. But uh, the first phase, which was getting new mains and et cetera, those, that's been taken care of. We're now in that second phase, which is going to be the water meeting, as you're, as you're talking about. There is going to be a major educational requirement that's going to be necessary there to uh, continue to make people aware of what's going to happen. There's going to be 
people who have been using flat rate water for so long that they're going to have a very difficult time trying to adjust uh, to this particular situation. Over the last two or three years, uh, the city of Terrytown has held several uh, informational meetings. And, you know, the, the word has been available as to what's coming on. And, uh, and it's going to be tough. Uh, you know, there's going to have to be insertions in, in water billing, for instance. Uh, we're going to have to work uh, on uh, a situation so that we don't have a tremendous increase in, in water costs uh, on the bills. But it's, uh, it's going to be an educational process. That's the big thing. We're going to have to educate uh, the, the uh, citizenry to, to the fact that more than likely the water bills are going to go up and they're going to pay for what they use. Any rebuttal, Jerry? Yeah, I'd like to clarify. We're, as the city of Terrytown, we're going to go ahead and, and go like a month or two months just to get it used. We still won't change the rates after it's all said. To get everybody used to it, we'll give them a price of what it's going to be from where they are, and then they'll have to make the adjustments. I mean, because we, we're just wasting water, and then we end up paying for sewer more than we have and everything else. So hopefully this will work out. Fine. Nothing on it. Okay. Brad Stamen with the next question. What are your thoughts on the Bellevue area and the possibilities of annexing it in the city of area? Mike, you go first. The people in Bellevue have pretty well expressed their opinion that they are uh, not in favor of that. Uh, it would be nice to annex Bellevue for a variety of reasons. Uh, Terrytown, when they were a village, uh, in 2006 annexed an area to the southwest and then in 2010 they also annexed another area. In both cases increased the, uh, the, the tax ability uh, tremendously because of, of the different style property. The same thing would happen if we get annexed Bellevue. Uh, I'd like to see Bellevue be annexed. It would be logical to be annexed to Terrytown. They're on Terrytown uh, utilities now. Uh, but I think that uh, there's going to be a, a tremendous uh, backlash from the area, from the residents of Bellevue. Yes, it's not going to happen if it's up, up to the residents. Jerry? Uh, we, were, we were furnishing the water and sewer for Bellevue for years. And uh, we had so many problems with our, the sewer lines, the water lines. And uh, we were trying to work out the deal for this, uh, going to the new sewers, new water lines. Okay, part of the deal does be is how we were we were servicing them, the state of Nebraska and the ones we're working this out with said we had to go ahead and take them in on it. Okay? So they're probably you know, I don't I don't know, they're they're per person, per household, that that is the most expensive part. And we're trying to work this out and, and when it's all said and done, if we get everything done it, it'll work out so that they'll go ahead and they're they're gonna pay so much a month now because we're putting so much money in there and supposedly this will work out to be the best situation for us and for them all right time for closing statements um we'll let uh, jerry go first well i appreciate you guys putting this on and, and working this out i said we're trying to go through a real tough deal that we've had to go through because we started out as a village and then we, as we increased with people and then with the laws and stuff they made us go ahead and do things that we didn't really want to do but you know everything's changing so we want to go ahead and make this thing work and we want to like i said I'd i like to see our finish finish the sewer and water project and get everything straightened out with bellevue and everything like that that's where I'm at. Thank you. Mike? I'd just like to thank the Chamber and the media for allowing us to appear and, and also conducting these uh, on all the contested races in the area. And again, I'd like to encourage everybody to make sure that you do vote on this coming Tuesday. And uh, I've, I've uh, spent most of my adult life uh, connected with Terrytown in some manner, so I hope to continue, continue on with that. And, and uh, my uh, number one thing on this uh, is the water. I've got a list here of Jerry Town issues. One is water, just like Jerry. So I think we're both thinking along the same lines there. The water is the, is the big thing. we got to get through that. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, being here. And uh, good luck in the election. Thank you.
take a little bit of a break and then uh, we're going to go to the Scotts Bluff School Board. All right, we're a little early, but I think we can uh, move forward now with the Scotts Bluff School Board candidates. And for the Scotts Bluff School Board, we have uh, Ruth Kozel over here. We have uh, Ralph Paez and Lori Browning. And there is uh, one other candidate um, that was not available tonight to be here, and that is Mark Lang. He gave us a short statement, and I'll read that for Mark. I'm sorry I'm not able to attend tonight's forum. I've been on the board for 16 years. I've been a part of many great accomplishments. When I ran for school board 16 years ago, I wanted to see more vocational opportunities for the students. And the biggest accomplishment I'm most proud of is our career academies. That would not have been accomplished without the board, staff, and the entire community. We're working very hard to keep our schools safe and secure. That's the statement from uh, Mark Lang uh, this evening. So we'll uh, start out with uh, Lori Browning with opening statements. She has uh, 90 seconds with her opening statement. Good evening. I'm Lori Armstrong Browning, and I am married to Scott Browning. I have two young children. I have Ben, who is three, and Parker, who's two. I grew up in Scotts Bluff. I also graduated from Scotts Bluff High School in 1996, so I am a Scotts Bluff graduate. Um, I decided to run for school board for three reasons. The first reason is because I was the attorney for the Classified Association. Um, I had to work with the school board often um, regarding the negotiations for the um, the salary of the classified association as well as benefits. One of the things I learned from working with the school board as well as going to conferences is that sometimes the school board has to see things as a business decision or they do see things as a, a business decision. And I think that can sometimes hurt our children who is really the whole reason um, that we need to uh, be on the school board. Um, and cause we need to make sure that the children are too protected. The second reason is I think that there's a lot of stuff going on in the country right now, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I believe that I'm going to be a different voice than maybe some of the other people on the um, board, and I think that's important. The third reason is because um, I represent the Department of Health and Human Services, and one thing I learned is that every child needs to have somebody that they can um, look to who is supportive to them, and sometimes that can't be the parents, and so it needs to be somebody else, such as teachers or uh, the food service or whoever that is. I believe that's important. All right. Thank you very much. Ralph, you're next. Good evening. I'm Ralph Paez, and I'm running for a seat of the Scottsdale School Board. I want to thank you all for coming and giving me the opportunity to earn your vote. <clears throat> I was born and raised here in Scottsdale, in the Scottsdale area. I'm engaged to an incredible woman, Heather Hayes. We have <clears throat> five daughters in the, in the Scottsdale school system now. I have been employed with the Roosevelt Public Power District as a lineman for 13 years. Um, I'm, I'm also an active member in a, Our Lady Guadalupe Catholic uh, Church. The reasons I'm competing for a seat on the Scottsdale School Board is because I feel I bring an out, outside perspective that most of our community, community members feel. Number one, my taxes increased with it, as everyone else's did for a great reason, a long overdue high school. I want to make sure every tax dollar is spent in, 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 as a necessity, not just because they say we've done something. I want to, number two, I deal with many issues now from parents in the school system because they trust me and know I would do what I can to help them and their children and get them in the right direction or the answers they are yearning for. Number three, children of our community are truly my passion. I coached Carpenter Center football for four years while my son played and also coached for a few years when I had no child participating at all. I am president of the Broadway Bombers, a developmental sophomore organization for the Scott Wolf High School. I am owner of the, an owner for the Panhandle Football Camp, which brings Nebraska football grades to our area. I have, do, and will continue to do so regardless if I am elected to help kids in our community achieve their goals and live better lives. Number four, the most important one, I'm a blue collar worker running to give back to my community and help make our school district continue in a positive direction. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Ruth, you're next. Okay. My name is Ruth Kozal, and I've been a resident of Scotts Bluff for almost 30 years. I've been married to my husband, Jim, for 28 years, and I am a, mo a mother, a stepmother, and a grandmother. 
I worked remotely as a software analyst for a company named Jack Henry Associates, and I've had that position for almost 38 years. I've served eight years on the school board, and I've had the honor of serving as the president representing our school board and our district for the past four years. I'm involved in three of the four committees uh, with, with the school board, and that's curriculum, finance, and student services. During my time on the board, we've seen great positive changes with our facilities, curriculum, and serving the needs of our students. I feel we've become one of the most, if not the most, progressive school district in Nebraska. And that is evidence today when our superintendent and director of curriculum uh, were in Chicago to accept the 2018 Midwest Regional Advanced Ed Values Driven Award of Excellence. It's a very prestigious award. And the values that they hold true for this are to dream big, stand for the learner, be bold and daring, drive potential, be tenacious, and build connections. Those are the values I want to continue building as a member of the school board. All right, thank you very much, Ruth. All right, first question, uh, Brian, I guess it's your turn here, and uh, Ralph, uh, you'll be first to respond. What changes would you like to see to the state funding formula for schools and how it affects property tax relief? Hmm. That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, taxes are, are huge. Property taxes are big in the state of Nebraska. That's probably the biggest complaint that you read about in, in the media. Um, as, as a, for an alternative, alternative measure, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to really look at another, another option of that because basically, you know, the, the tax, tax in each district are, come from the people that live in that district. That, that's just, that's a good question, and I, and I guess that's that's why it's caused so much controversy in the state of Nebraska. Ruth, you're next. The, the formula that's being used uh, is terribly inequitable for all of our districts. In fact, Nebraska is the, the 49th in the nation ranked in state support of public education, something that our Nebraska Associated School Boards, uh, one of the figures that they've given us. And it really needs to be looked at within the state legislature. That's really where it's going to be resolved. Uh, there are things such as um, sales tax on online purchases, which they have not, they've rejected thus far, and there's absolutely no reason for that, I don't, I don't feel. But it's something that we definitely have to address because uh, we have, uh, the property taxes that we pay here are entirely different from what has to be done on the east side of the state. Population has a lot to do with it. But our, our farmers in particular are terribly overtaxed in this area. We, the levies that we have, we assess within our district to make ends meet is much higher than even like in, in the military school district. There's a great difference, but it's something that we can't really do ourselves on the school board, but it's something we have to do working with our state legislators in order to, to deal with it. Laurie, you're next. I was going to agree. I, I would agree with Ruth Kozel that, um, unfortunately, we don't have a big say as a school board member as to what the legislature has determined for the taxes and uh, how the levies are going to be determined. That is determined by the legislature. Again, the school board, what we can do, along with members of the community, is go to our senators and go to our lawmakers and try and get something passed um, so that there is some different ways of determining what the taxes are going to be. Again, you know, our, our farmers who are paying such a high amount for each of their acres, um, it is hard for them. And it, I, I can understand why it's um, difficult for them. Um, one of the things that we can say is that for the last two years, the levy amount has, has essentially um, stayed the same. Um, it's been gone down, I think, 0.003% in the last year. So hey, that's something, but at least it is um, remaining the same. Um, but again, that's all set by legislature, and it's something that um, we need to get our lawmakers involved with. All right, next question from Scott Miller. Kind of uh, related to that issue, what can you see as the board's role in controlling expenses and possibly challenging what some may call unnecessary spending? And Ruth, you're first on this. And that, that's uh, not an issue, again, where we have to always keep cognizant of our constituents and it is their money that we are spending. So to thoroughly understand what's in the budget, that's one reason why I'm on the member of the Finance Committee, to see how that money is being spent, to question anything that does come about, and uh, just to get an understanding. But it's also our, our job 
as, as board members to make sure that our constituents understand what our money is being spent on and, and why we are doing this in order to, to meet the needs of our students. Laurie, you're next. Um, I think what is important for the community to know, and it's one of the things that I've been working on, is I have reviewed all the minutes of the school board for the last year and a half. I have also attended some of the school board meetings. I attended the fiscal um, meeting that, that happened, I believe it was in September of this year. Every person in the community has the opportunity to go to a school board meeting. They get to have their voices heard if they want to have their voices heard. That's where you can find out what the money is being spent on. And it's important for everybody to have that ability to go and have their voice heard. Um, the things that I think a lot of the community members don't know is that a lot of the things that the, the um, school has to pay for is already predetermined by grants or by levies. Uh, so that the school board doesn't get to determine what that money is going to be um, used for because it's already been earmarked. There's a general fund that the school board has, and that's where um, the school board actually has the ability to make payments. And that's where I dealt with the school board a lot, and that's when trying to determine what the amount is going to be for the for the classified association. How much are we going to pay them? What are we going to do for benefits? What what are we going to pay the principals? Those kind of things, um, and that comes out of the the, the general fund. So again, I think it's just part of your civic duty as a member of the community to go to those, those meetings and be heard. Ralph? Well, again, you know, when it comes to taxes and, and property owners and, and, and when it comes to people, money coming out of their pocket, taking food out of their mouth, it's it's a very sensitive subject. Um, but when it comes to the school district, I, you know, and it has, the question was, as, as a school board member, you know, what do we plan to do about it is, is what I plan to do about it is make sure that we explore every option. I think I owe that to every voter out there. I want to look to make sure that 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 if we're deciding on something, that there isn't a better option or a cheaper way or, or something better. So we're getting the biggest bang for the buck at every, every red cent of every dollar every taxpayer is paying. Um, you know, one of the big things is, for instance, when when uh, when the, the middle school was uh, being refaced and whatnot, uh, remodeled there. I, I know of, of of in 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 town, in our, from our own our own community business owners that were offering to to put bids in that work and also give back 20 percent 20 percent of of the profits there. But then that was never explored. I mean, it was a masonry guy that came to me personally with this. Um, you know why? Why we're not using more of our in-house people to to keep those spend those tax dollars in-house? Why? Why are we outsourcing our, our, our pictures? You know to somebody else. And we have you know countless photographers here in town that we could use locally and patron to give them back the money that they give to us in tax dollars and spend it locally. Any rebuttal from anybody? I've been remiss here. A few questions. I would, I would just like to comment a little bit on, on some of that, too. Uh, but Nebraska does rank number three in the nation as the highest percentage of money going directly into the classroom for the support of our students. And we rank number five as being the, one of the lowest percentage of money going to the administration. And um, talking about the pictures and things like that, uh, uh, before, you know, if people have concerns on that, they do need to find out just how that money is being spent and what not only it's not just a money situation, it's, it's a classroom management situation. We still want our kids to be in the classroom and not out, for example, taking pictures. Anybody else? Okay. Next question from Brad Steen. Is, uh, is our administration, our administrative staff, um, is it right sized for our district? And let's see who's uh, turn is, I guess it's Ralph's. Well, yeah, Ralph's first. You know, I guess, again, you know, with the comments from, from the other two candidates here, it, it's, you need to go to meetings and find out exactly what's going on. Um, I have I have a hard time believing that uh, the, the Scottsdale Public School System is going to employ these administrators just to employ administrators. I think there's, there's a need for them. There's a reason why we have them. Um, I, I mean, uh, they're there for a reason. I, you know, I, I just I just have a hard time believing that our current board members are going to approve positions just to, just because. Um, so, to answer the question, right now, yes, I feel that administ our administrative uh, positions 
are a necessity, and, and that's why we have them. And, and I have all the faith in our current school board members, and that's why we have them. Ruth? Okay. Um, because I am a member of three of the committees, uh, we deal directly with the administrative, you know, the, the curriculum, uh, CF, head of the curriculum, CFO, uh, head of student services. And I tell you, when going in those committee meetings, I am amazed at how much they have, to, what ground they have to cover uh, and to serve the needs of our students day in and day out. And those people work tirelessly. Uh, and then likewise with the other administrative principals and the assistant principals, making school visits and finding out just how effective they are with their and supportive of their teachers and staff members, which in turn then they can do their job of teaching our students, which is probably the primary reason why we're all here. Laurie? I don't think that the administration's administrative staff is too large. I think that it's actually a really good thing that our staff is that large because we have been so instrumental in doing the career academy. We have our curriculum has um, really surpassed a lot of the schools in Nebraska. Um, one of the things if you read the school board minutes or go to those meetings is you get to hear from each of, not each of the administrators, but you get to hear from the committees and you get to find out, okay, this is what they're doing. So Mike Mason talks about how you know they're gonna start new testing for um, the youth in the elementary schools about um, their reading comprehension and instead of doing it an old way, they're going to increase it to a new way. And I think those are good things that our administrators need to be able to do. Um, and we need to have enough of them that they have that ability to focus on their specialized areas and make a real difference for our students. All right, any rebuttal? I just want to add one thing to that. I think, uh, you know, one thing that, that, that needs to really be taken into consideration is with our, our beautiful new high school, our new curriculum with the career academies. I think it's very attractive uh, to other, other, other students of other school districts uh, to allow them to option in and, and take advantage of everything that we have to offer at Scottsdale Public Schools. Um, so with that, I, I believe that our, our school, the, the, the population of our students is growing. So I think it really helps to have that many administrators involved. All right. Anybody else? Brian, you're up next. What should be the district's role or involvement be in the proposed aquatic center? And Ruth, you're first. Swimming pools are extremely expensive, as we found out. When we partnered with the city, 50-50, we could, we could fit it into our budget. But the city pulled out, and then a lot of that burden came upon us. And the group that is uh, the volunteer group of the Splash Foundation is trying to help and, and, and couldn't swim. So we, you know, the, the, the board has, first of all, not made any commitments whatsoever. I am not making any kind of a, this is, this is me talking, I am not representing the board on the opinion here. But uh, I, I look at us as being, we still want to keep our swim team and be supportive. Uh, but certainly we don't want to run a swimming pool. But we would like to participate, uh, we, I feel we would like to participate in doing our fair share to keep it going. Lori? Well, I grew up in Scottsbluff. I went to school in Scottsbluff. I watched a lot of people who went, did swimming and diving. That was when we still had diving boards and the high board and all of those kind of things back in the dark ages of 1996. It was an important part. I mean, it was, I had many friends who were involved in the CCAS. Um, I am a business owner, so I do have to look at things a little bit from a budget perspective, and I think that, unfortunately, it is very expensive to run a pool and have that kind of maintenance. Um, again, you know, when you look at the comments um, that have come up about the aquatic center over the last year or so with the meetings, it's very clear that everybody thinks it's a really good idea and that if we can come up with a solution to have it, then that's what we want to do. Um, and I think the board has, tr I mean, from what I could tell, it looks like the board has tried to determine whatever they can do to save it. Um, but again, we have to look at what is best for the district and um, how are we gonna meet those needs of the students. Well, well, to, to kind of answer 
answer that. Um, I attended the city council's uh, debate a couple weeks ago at the Guadalupe Center. And for my own knowledge and uh, I, for a, an opportunity for me to play devil's advocate to those candidates, I was able to ask the question about the aquatic center and, and, and the position of, of, the, of Scottsdale Public Schools, the district itself. And I wasn't, because due to, due to the, the taxes, the, the tax the situation that's going to be coming up to be voted on here also on Tuesday, um, that was a concern and a, and, a, and a hot topic for the candidates. So I asked what, what, was, what would be the position of Scottsdale Public Schools with, with this new aquatic center? And the answer I was, I was told was this is going to be a majority of private, private donors, private money involved. So the school district wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be putting money into that, but basically it would be kind of an, a rental agreement with that aquatic center. And to keep our, 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 sea pro, our, our excuse me, swimming program going, I think as, as far as the district goes, that would be the best thing for us to have a, a, just a rental agreement to be able to use the facilities for our swim team to continue and, and strive. Any rebuttal at all? Any other questions from the media? Scott? Um, a lot is made of per pupil spending versus uh, test scores when it comes to positive outcomes, especially for graduates. Aside from the academy, the career academy, I should say, uh, what else should the school district be involved in to make sure that we have positive outcomes for our graduates and that they are prepared for either a career or college? And Laurie, your first year. Well, um, what I think has to happen is, um, excuse me, I just lost my train of thought. So, um, the outcomes of the school, one of the things that um, changes is that the Nebraska, the Nebraska changes their requirements for the visa testing as well. And so then our administrators have to come up with new curriculum. So it's our um, administrators who have to come up with a new curriculum in order to make sure that our needs and test scores go back up to where they have been in the, in the past. Um, besides the career academies, I think what's important is keeping the kids in school. I mean, what can we do to keep these kids involved, keep them interested? Um, and again, that comes down to the people that are there. All right, we're about ready to start. These are the candidates for Gearing School Board. Uh, we have President Mary Wynn, Brian Copsey, and Shane Schimmick. Uh, Brady Shaw is unavailable tonight to be here, but he did uh, leave a statement, and so uh, I will read that statement. Uh, he says, my name is Brady Shaw. For the past four years, I have served with the Gearing Public Schools Board of Education. I am a native of Gearing, born and raised, currently reside south of town. I have a strong passion for education as a former teacher myself and being married to one. I see a lot of issues facing our youth today and want to do my part to help provide the students and staff of this district with the tools they need to have the most impactful education. So when my daughter reaches school age, I will know she's being well equipped. While on the board, I have worked alongside fellow board members and our superintendent to cut our budget and wasted spending. In addition, through this planning, I was able to be a part of the successful bond passing for our high school remodel and addition. This is a much needed improvement to our facilities and will help us in many ways as we move forward into the future. With my construction background, I have been able to provide insight during these beginning phases of this project. A key issue that faces our school district is our upcoming grade reconfiguration and career academies. This will be a drastic change with a lot of moving pieces. Gearing is the only school district in the state that is still a 10 through 12 grade high school. Part of this realignment is the high school remodel addition previously mentioned. It will also make the conversion to a 9 to 12 high school. We will have to make sure the move is an easy transition for the students as well as the staff. Staff reassignments will take place and will take a great deal of planning. Within this move will also be on the ongoing push for career academies and how we can provide our students with as many opportunities as possible. 
In the last four years, I've learned a lot being on the school board, but still have even more to learn. I will continue to strive to provide our staff and students with the resources they need. My passion is that every student would receive the best education possible and eventually be an active contributor to our society and community. And that's the statement from Brady Shaw, who again could not be with us tonight. So, um, looks like Brian won the toss, elected to receive. So he will be the, he will do the opening statement. He's not deferring or anything like that. So Brian, is that an option? I don't know whether it was. Okay. All right, I'm Brian Copsey. I'm running for re-election for the Gearing School Board. I lived in Gearing most all of my life and graduated from Gearing High School in 1987. I have been married to my wife, Camden, for 29 years. And we have four kids who've all attended and graduated Gearing. My wife and I are business owners in Gearing, and my son, Brandon, now works with me in our local business. I served two terms on the Gearing School Board, and I'm proud of the work we've done this past eight years. The year I got elected, the bond was passed for construction of Lincoln Elementary School. The project came in on budget, on time, and was a terrific improvement for the local community, and allows us more room in our elementaries. We also have had to make tough financial decisions as we deal with state funding constraints. We closed and sold the Cedar Canyon School and moved those students into the buildings in town. We've overhauled our reading program, updated our math curriculum, and are currently working on grade realignment as we change from a junior high building to a middle school. The bond for the high school had overwhelming community support, and that project is currently on time and on budget and has generated a lot of excitement in the district. I bring eight years of experience to the school board. I have served as president of the board for the last two years. If re-elected, I will continue to work hard to be an advocate for our students, supportive of our staff, and financially responsible to our community. All right. Shane, you're up next. Yeah, my name is Shane Schellick. I'm originally from Goshen County, Wyoming, born and raised there. Uh, then moved to Gearing 12 years ago. Uh, we established a grain elevator business mm -hmm. down here. I've been managing and regional manager of that for the last 12 years. I have three kids, a set of twins that are 12 years old and uh, eight year old, all attending the Gearing schools. Uh, basically, the, I'd like to get more involved in the community where I can help with my experience and my knowledge in the past of uh, building and working with people in college businesses. Uh, I'd like to push career academies and vocational programs and develop that for opportunities for the students to have a, more of a correction when they're leaving the school and uh, see if there's opportunities to get the kids involved in stuff that will bring them back to this community. All right, Mary Wynn. My name is Mary Wynn. I've lived in Gearing's for the past 12 years. However, my uh, history with Gearing Public Schools began in 1980 when I first started teaching. And I retired after 28 years at Gearing High School teaching English and speech and coaching speech. And two years after retirement is when I ran for the school board. So like Brian, I have been on the board for some very significant and exciting changes. People who know me know that I originally ran for the board because I had an agenda. And that agenda was to get rid of the direct instruction reading program. We were finally able to accomplish that. It didn't come quickly and it didn't come easily, but it was something that I felt really needed to be done for students. Uh, direct instruction was stifling their love of learning and creativity. This year I have a much more positive agenda. I am seeking re-election because I want to see it build to fruition some current things that we're doing, primarily our professional learning communities and the completion of the high school, uh, putting into effect the grade level a great configuration. All right, very good. So that are our opening statements. Uh, we're ready for the first question. Shane, you'll be the first to respond on this, and Brian Sherrod has the first question. What changes would you like to see to the state fund funding formula for schools, and how it affects property tax relief? Which change you said? Yes. Um, with the funding, I mean, our formula, 
as we all spoke to earlier, you heard earlier, there's a, it's heavily leaned on the farmers and the ag producers and they buy the acres. And uh, I would like to see if there's an opportunity to change that and share that and get it balanced between uh, the citizens and the communities and the uh, businesses that are locally here and get less on the ag side of it. I'm a heavily ag based ag person and I just like to see it get more balanced amongst uh, everyone in the community. Mary? I agree with Shane. I'm also from a farm background and uh, too much of the burden is being placed on the farming community and landowners in the central and western part of the state. We need a different uh, balance so that we are so that the eastern part of the state is paying more of its share. Brian. Uh, the state funding formula is, is very complicated and I don't know that anybody can really speak very accurately on how everything is, is allocated to the schools, but we are a very uh, state dependent district as are a lot of the districts in our local area. Uh, the Gearing School District has been a longtime member of GNSA, which is our legislative voice for <coughs> subsidized school districts in the state representing the larger districts uh, to try and speak with senators and educate them. Uh, legislatively, it's hard when senators are term limited to get the eastern senators to understand rural issues and understand how that funding affects them. And unfortunately, by the time they might get their heads wrapped around it, they're out. So our challenge as a district is to spend those dollars as wisely as we can and try and continue to advocate uh, with our legislators and our administrators in Lincoln to try and, and make some changes so it's a little more equitable. All right, Mary gets uh, the question this time from Scott Miller. And just so you know, there's some common questions, and this is going to be another one, but we'll get to some specifics in a moment. Um, what do you see as the board's role to control expenses uh, for the district, and what is the role for challenging uh, expenses that some may say uh, don't need to be spent? Uh, Mary, you get this one. All right. First. I'll first of all try to address the first part of the question. I really believe that the Gearing Board is very fiscally conservative and fiscally responsible. Uh, we have no fluff. Every item in the budget is something that is absolutely needed. Uh, but at the same time, we, because we are driven by curriculum, we are always looking ahead at what our curriculum needs are going to be. And that is not an area where we are, that we are going to be short funded. We, uh, I'm not on the business committee and I've never been on the business committee. I'm much more involved in curriculum, but I know they spend a great deal of time looking at every item in the budget, month by month, looking at the expenses and trying to make every dollar count. And what we are looking at all the time is what is best for students. That is what drives our decisions, and that was, that is what we make our budgetary decisions on. Brian? Uh, Gearing has one of the lowest um, spending per student in the state, and so we are very fiscally conservative when it comes to spending on students, but we also want every dollar we spend to affect them the most. So when we do make decisions, we try and keep students <coughs> the most for every dollar we spend. We are a district that is levied at the very max level we can in the state, so there's not, you know, we can't go out and just levy some more money and add to our budget. So we know what our budget is each year when we get the formula from the state. And we just have to make it work. And we've got a great team. Our business manager uh, works with our superintendent, who are very educated on, on the funding formula and budgeting process. Uh, I've served on the business committee all eight years. I've been on the board, and we, you know, we review all the AP expenses every month. We 
make recommendations to the rest of the board for expenditures, and I feel we we do the very best we can to make sure we eliminate any kind of excess because there really isn't any. We just have to spend it as wisely as we can for the students. Shane, you're next. Yeah, I have to agree from, from what I've reviewed. Gearing does a good job of trying to keep their budget under control. Um, it's just one of those things that you just have to be diligent about. Well, maybe, you know, manage it so you can. Uh, keep it a balance. I think there's opportunities maybe for to get a lot of work with other districts if there's an opportunity. I know it's been difficult in the past, but maybe there's a cost savings or an opportunity to balance that out with it and get more opportunities. Question and Brian, you get to respond first. All right, this one's more specific to gearing. Uh, the Saskatchewan School Board uh, candidates talked about uh, their career academies and uh, they were referring to themselves as, uh, but it's been referred to in the community as the IT school. And uh, there's been a lot of uh, one of the candidates talked about uh, optioning in students. Uh, are we losing students to Skyswell? And if so, what, how are you? How would you propose we address that and uh, make make gearing the hit school? Well, I think our districts are a little unique in probably most anything west of Grand Island, and that we have two Class B school districts, right? across the river that for many reasons kids I mean if they're struggling in a class or whether it's athletics or academics might make it easy to seem like a choice to go one way or the other and that works for Scott's Bluff and it works for Gearing and it works for other community or for other districts as well. Um, I think Gearing has suffered from maybe we don't toot our own horn enough. I mean there's so much good things that go inside that building we have extremely high academic standards it is tough for kids. Uh, we expect a lot out of those kids. But I think if you visit with the majority of parents and staff and students, they appreciate that um, what education they get at Gearing and the opportunity we present with the small, smaller enrollment than what Scott's Bluff has. Uh, the new facilities obviously are going to um, be nice and shiny and new. But behind the scenes, Career Academy development has, I mean, we were the first in that. Um, there's a lot of things going on that maybe we haven't done a good enough job communicating out to the community that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of news about our STEM program with Justin Reimuth and the national awards we've won on that. And that's carrying over into our medical programs and other programs we're bringing online. So we just need to do a little bit better job uh, advertising gearing uh, to be a school. And we're not going to go out and openly recruit kids, but we hope our doors are open and they come on in. Shane? I do think that's an issue with, uh, and an issue and a challenge with the kids that are leaving the Gearing School District over there. Uh, because of the opportunities there, I think we need to really, like I said, work with other, the other districts if it's possible, or we need to see what we need to do to develop and balance out or give more opportunities for the kids to stay here and get focused in what direction or career they're wanting to go after in the future. Um, I, do, I think our education level and our standards are very high in gearing, and that leaves you with those challenges of if it's easier across to the river or whichever to go there and get by. And I do like keeping our standards high. Uh, it's just working with them on seeing what it does to keep them here and as we need to whatever program it is available. Mary? Unfortunately, some of the students that we have lost, well, perhaps any of the students that we have lost, it's been an issue of athletics, and we are not going to hire or fire coaches to appease parents. We are going to do what we do best, 
and that is offer a high academic level of education. We, as Brian said, we need to do a better job of showing the community what we are doing well, and we are doing many things well. Um, as I mentioned before, and might have an opportunity to talk about it a little bit more, our uh, professional learning communities. We had building construction, that type of career academy, before anybody else in the area did. Uh, hearing students received an excellent education. Um, if the parents consider athletics to be more important, then so be it. We're not going to wring our hands and gnash our teeth. We are going to remain committed to quality education in Gary. All right, Brian, you have uh, the next question. And Shane, you are first. What are your thoughts, pro or con, on consolidation of the freshman academy into the high school? Um, I'm for it. I think as we got to develop and get it set up like the other districts are in the state, um, I think it's great for the kids. I think they're ready to be separated. I, I think it's good to incorporate that into the high school. Mary? It's absolutely something that needs to be done. And it came as a result of uh, 2014 strategic planning. Uh, a group of people comprised of members of the community, parents, teachers, building administrators, board members. This was our number one priority, grade level configuration and getting the ninth graders to the high school. It was that decision that necessitated uh, passing a bond and providing updated facilities and a new academy for the ninth graders. You know, we have had the freshman academy for probably around 10 years, and it has proven to be very successful. We used it in our existing facility, so now it makes sense to build a new area for them and continue this program and allow the ninth graders to be there to take high school classes if need be, and we're going to have much better utilization of our shared staff. Brian? Uh, we, we were one of the few districts in the state that had a freshman academy concept where we kind of took the junior high building and segregated them about as much as you can in one end of the building so they had their own experience as, as they were part of the high school curriculum. And one of the original Lincoln bonds uh, or bond projects we had was actually to construct a freshman academy, and that, that didn't pass. But with the high school project, we're still going to maintain our freshman academy experience at the high school level. They're going to have their own uh, area for the most part. They're going to have a little bit different schedule than some of the high school kids. But it's going to eliminate a lot of uh, staff running around. We've got some staff that have to teach classes, language classes, math classes at the junior high, so they have to commute. Uh, we've got kids walking between buildings um, after school for sports or whatever it might be. It's not a safe situation. Um, our kids have been very successful in the freshman academy. It's been shown to be that age group is one of the largest at risk of when they drop out of school, when they get into the high school level, so we're able to give them their own counselors, um, some additional services for that age group to make sure that transition to high school. When you're throwing in 15 year olds with 18 year olds, that's a big age development difference and it really helps them bridge that gap and make them successful as they continue their high school career. All right, next question uh, goes to Scott. And Mary, you are first this time. Uh, the high school has been the scene of a few incidents recent past involving assaults on staff. Uh, the district has approved having a second SRO in the high school uh, scene. What else aside from that may or should be done to help ensure the safety of staff and students in the school? Well, getting the second SRO is helping. Uh, the other thing that is that's going to happen with the completed high school is one entrance. I can't even remember how many doors we have at Geary High School right now. Uh, 
as far as um, situations such as that, I I don't know that anything can be done. Uh, teachers are in their classrooms early, available to the students. The dean out with us, and uh, we have uh, time now first for opening statements. Kelly, you draw the uh, long straw, I guess, so you are first. Okay, hi, my name is Kelly Sides. I am married to Russ Sides. We uh, have five kids between us and nine grandchildren. He's a local contractor here. Uh, I've worked for Scottsdale County in the assessor's office for over seven years now. And I have run for county clerk just hoping to advance the office in some technology. Okay. Kurt? Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight for this evening's forum. I, uh, I'm sure everybody has something more interesting to do this evening. Uh, my name is Kurt Zajan. Uh, most people say Zadina. I apologize. It's okay. Um, I am a candidate for Scottsdale County Clerk. I've lived my entire life in Nebraska. Honestly, it's not for everyone. <laughs> I'm very proud to call Nebraska my home. I'm engaged to Kristen Blount. live over in Mitchell. I have one daughter. Neuroscience student at Columbia University of New York. I graduated from Superior High School in 1978 from the University of Nebraska in 1982 with a degree in education. I've taught school in Wood River, Chapel, Mitchell, and Alliance. I've taught a couple college courses back in the 90s. For the past 25 years, I've focused on technology or educational technology, and I'm currently Technology Director at Ohio Public Schools. I have a number of issues that I look at that are facing Nebraska as well as the nation, basically with getting people to vote. And I think the salvation of the state is watchfulness in the citizen. You can find that on the north face of the Nebraska State Capitol. Time's up. All right. Thank you very much. Your sign says Kirk. And is it Kirk or Kurt? Kurt. Kurt, K-U-R-T. K-U-R-T. All right, that's what my paper says here. So it's Kurt. All right. Um, first question goes to uh, Brian here. And Kurt, you'll be first to answer. Okay. What is your knowledge of the office and the duties involved? Well, basically, I look at the county clerk and, and the duties that are involved in the office. The main one is the head of elections. I think it's very important that uh, in today's environment that we get as many voters to the polls as possible. And one of the examples I have is that um, in Scottsbluff County, 89% of the people that are eligible to vote are registered to vote. However, in the primary election, only 18% of us voted. That's terrible. And we got to figure out a way to get more people to vote. In 2016, in the presidential election, only 56.9% of the people voted in the presidential election. All right. Over in, in Garden County, 59% of the people voted in a primary election this year. And they basically, they have mail ballots. They do the entire county that way. However, state law doesn't allow us to do that in Scottsdale County big. However, we can apply to get, uh, apply uh, for basically voting out in the outlying areas, such as Mitchell, Minotaire, uh, Lake Minotaire. Um, we can apply to have those email ballots. Kelly? There is a lot more to the office than just the elections. Um, they are I will be the secretary to the commissioners twice a month. We handle payroll for the county. We handle payables, take the claims from office heads and elected officials. So uh, we work to streamlining that so it's easier to get that information 
trips from the elected officials to, to the clerk's office to get bills paid. And time card wise, I don't know how to you know, look into whatever we could do to make it anything easier for everybody that runs the, the different departments. Any rebuttal? No? Okay. Scott, you are next, and Kelly, you'll be first this time. What type of things would you like to bring to the office to help improve that efficiency of those items that are <coughs> responsible, the county clerk's responsibility, including the elections and the items that you had mentioned? Uh, I'd like to utilize the program that we use, uh, the company that we use, uh, advance that the technology to be more current to interact with the other department heads and where I did create a database, so I just know that I have the knowledge to learn how to do what needs to be done. Okay, Kurt? Uh, basically, for the last uh, about 28 years, I've been developing databases in all different types of capacities for schools around the state of Nebraska. In 1980, or 1996, um, I actually developed an electronic database in, Omaha uh, area so that school students could vote online for the uh, election. I've created all kinds of databases from uh, um, time clocks to uh, uh, curriculum development. Uh, does that side with the county? Not so much. Uh, I work with a, a company um, out of uh, South Dakota that deals with payroll. Yes, there are all kinds of things that databases can be used for. If they don't make things simpler, save money and time, they're usually not worth doing. And that's that's my philosophy behind uh, using technology in general. Um, I think that uh, basically helping the, all the departments in the county succeed at what they're doing and, and saving them time will save the taxpayers uh, money Kelly, any rebuttal? Okay. Brad, you're next with the question. And uh, Kurt, you'll be first. If you are elected as uh, Central County uh, Clerk, what do you see as your role with the county commissioners? Well, it, number one, I mean, you're the clerk, the official clerk and, and secretary and the secretary to the, to the county commissioners. And mainly making sure that uh, any of the commissioners um, basically uh, orders that they, they uh, need to have uh, published in the newspaper and so on and so forth get published in a timely manner because they can't uh, you know they can't go on and, and uh, do do their due diligence if they don't have things reported in the paper for meeting with their uh, positions here and back there yeah. um, just make sure you're really up to the mic okay like I am here all right so I'll make sure you're you're really up to the mic so everybody can hear and that way we can also get it on videotape too all right and some of you in the back may decide it's not church and you can move up to the front. <laughs> <laughs> and the board as well, uh, liaison if you say, uh, people coming with ideas that they haven't been able to approach 
the commissioners themselves. So I'll be that sort of role too, aside from getting the meetings ready for them and publishing the agendas. Kurt, any rebuttal? No? Okay, Brian, you're next. Okay. What are your thoughts, pro or con, on switching to all mail-in ballots, if that would be allowed by the state? Kelly, you're first on this. I am going to have to look into this. I've talked to people both ways. Uh, I was told it was a very bad idea. It was a dumb idea. I know it's my job to get people interested in voting. So if that would be the way to get it done, I would look into it, absolutely. I just know people like to go to the polls, get their sticker, and let everybody know they did, but not enough of them are doing that. Kurt? Well, I, I think it's probably a good idea, and the reason why is because in the primary election alone, 18% of the people that voted voted by mail-in ballot. There were 749 ballots sent out. 688 of them were returned to the county in the in the primary election. I think that education. Um, back when I was in the civics class, all the time, I would uh, ask for the county clerk to come to civics class and and discuss voting. Because the research in, in basically in education shows that once we get a student to vote in that first election, they will vote in ongoing elections. Um, I look at it and, and I already know that uh, in a county of more than 10,000 people, uh, the state will not, you can't do it. However, you can apply for the uh, smaller precinct. So most likely, um, Scotts Bluff and Gearing would not be able to vote by mail-in ballot. But that's not to say that we couldn't promote people or promote the idea to ask for the mail-in ballot. Back in 1980, or I'm going to say 1978, when I did my first absentee ballot, you had to give a reason to be absent. Well, I was in college in my hometown long drive. They allowed us to do it. Now you don't have to do that. Any other questions from the meeting? <coughs> um, we will start with uh, closing arguments and Kurt, you are first. Again, thank you for uh, coming out this evening and to the forum. Thank you to the chamber and the media uh, for sponsoring this. I think that, uh, like I said in my opening, uh, Basically, the, the salvation of the state is watchfulness in the citizen. And it's so important that as, as citizens that we participate, not only in elections, but we participate in forums like this. Um, my background in technology uh, can be utilized greatly here in the county. Um, and I think that, uh, like I said, to be, uh, I want to help the county in doing what they, what they do, and in order to do that, it's very important that uh, I, I learn the roles of all the county um, offices and uh, work with them in due diligence so that they, that they can succeed. Right. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to thank every the media and the chamber, of course. Uh, I want to make some changes just to streamline some processes. I want to advance the technology to office, for our offices to talk with each other. I want to establish a relationship with elected officials in this county and other county clerks, you know, <coughs> get some guidance from them how to, to uh, proceed with the, the new job. And uh, I and very willing to learn and always have been eager to do that. Um, I'm not afraid of change. And thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Kelly and Kurt, for uh, being here tonight. Thank you very much. All right, we're ready.
ready for the uh, Scotts Bluff Council candidates. As you see, there's five of them there, so I'm going mobile now. And uh, we'll see how that works. I think we'll be all right. Um, all right, so we have uh, Jeannie McCarrigan, Nathan Green, Jordan Caldwell, Terry Schaub, and Joanne Phillips. And unlike what I did with Kurt's name, did I mess up anybody's name? No? Okay, they're all pretty simple. All right, so um, it looks like in this particular interest, inter, uh, situation, Jeannie is the, Jean's the first one to uh, go ahead and speak with the opening statement, and uh, you can start now. Okay, hopefully you can hear me. Um, my name is Jeannie McCarrigan. Um, I was born and raised here in Scotts Bluff. I um, have four children, ages 18, 17, 13, and 7, and of course I have a husband. Um, I've been employed as a CFO for Olic Industries for the past three years, and prior to that I was a commercial lender for 20 years for a major bank. I'm the treasurer for Capstone Child Advocacy Center, uh, board chair for the 3E initiative, which is every child, every day, everywhere. Um, I also um, serve on the City of Scotts Bluffs LBA 40 Review Committee currently. Um, I think it's in uh, some of the issues that I'm interested in on, for the City of Scotts Bluff is um, business development and expansion. Also, um, building and developing relationships with our youth. And um, I think it's important to partner with the schools and colleges to build a workforce for our new businesses and that that are coming to the area. So, Nathan, you're next. <coughs> Getting used to having to wear glasses here. So. My name is Nathan Green. Uh, uh, my wife Kelly of 11 years and I are proud parents of three now. Uh, we have William, who's nine, he's a third grader at Longfellow. Jackson is six, he's a first grader at Longfellow. And we have little Abigail, who's three, at kids' first daycare. Uh, she was homesick today from school. She got a flu shot and didn't react well to get the poke, so she spiked a fever and had to stay home. <coughs> uh, we've lived in Scotts Bluff for eight years. And I currently work for a small business that manufactures and fits robotics and prosthetics. Uh, I was raised in Omaha, uh, went to school uh, in Kearney, where I received my bachelor's of science in education. I uh, furthered my education in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, where I earned four more degrees from Century College uh, in the orthotic technician, prosthetic technician, orthotic practitioner, and prosthetic practitioner. I was raised uh, a third degree master mason lifetime member of the NRA, the Eagle Scout, and enjoy hunting and fishing and backyard camping with my family. Um, I currently am a Cub Scout Master for Pack 5 and uh, I would love to have the opportunity to city council. Um, can't quite see the sign behind you there, so I don't know how long I want to apologize. All right, Jordan, you are next. Okay. Well, good evening and thank you, Chamber, and thank you to the local media for hosting this event. My name is Jordan Caldwell, and I am a lifelong Panhandle resident. I continue to be aware of the issues and opportunities here for the city of Scotts Bluff. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm the director of clinical services at Regional West Physicians Clinic. I'm very active in the community, and I volunteer in many organizations. My wife, Tiana, and I have two young children, and we have chosen to call Scotts Bluff our home. I believe in the importance of giving back to our community, and that is why I'm here running for re-election tonight. Thank you. Terry. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Chamber of Commerce. Thank you to everybody that is in attendance tonight. I am as well a lifetime member of this community. I was born and raised here, have left here, and don't plan on leaving here until um, it gets too cold. Um, family history is a business owner within this community. The business that was developed was started by my father within this community, Gary's Cleaning Restoration years and years ago, and it goes even, even, 
beyond that with uh, Gary's Restaurant Lounge. I'm committed to this community. My children have moved out of this community because there's nothing here for them within this community. I have volunteered many hours with the Scotts Bluff City Fire Department, Scotts Bluff Rural Fire Department, and Mitchell Fire Department. I am currently the district rep for the Bay of Nebraska. And I just got my 10 seconds. <laughs> Okay, Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanne Phillips. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. I'm grateful for the experience of um, speaking to you and also for the experience of being able to run for city council. My husband, Blair, is in the audience and I want to thank him for supporting all of my adventures and he's on with me. And um, we moved here four years ago, so we're transplants. But um, we got off uh, when we first came here and the next day my husband said I love it here he's from a larger city than I am and I'm like I don't know there's one road in and one road out but we stayed around and um, talked to different people went to different businesses and it, it was the welcoming attitude and the um, community uh, atmosphere that um, we accepted our jobs here we both work at Regional West and um, so here we are and we call this home so Nebraska is not for everyone but it sure is for us so I am the um, current director of behavioral health uh, program at Regional West. For the past um, four years, I have been director of risk management, and I've taken over this job uh, now. So I'm very excited, and I'm very interested in mental health needs in the community, especially adolescents. And I've spoken to Senator Stinner and um, the governor, and we're all partnering to bring more services to the community. Um, I have a background, I'm a registered nurse, I taught health law and uh, bioethics at um, Texas A&M, so I bring with me a very thoughtful uh, manner in thinking about what is the best for everyone. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll get to the questions now. Nathan, you'll be the first to respond, and Scott will ask the question. Well, coming up on the November ballot, along with you all, is the LB-357 asset sales tax on the infrastructure. Uh, for specific items for the city of Scottsdale. If you would, please uh, explain your stance, pro or con, for this proposition. I think the infrastructure is an important and eminent issue. Um, making sure that we put money back into the roads, the water, power, sewer, waste, and um, the other systems. Um, I think that's always going to be a challenge. They're always going to be aging and they're always going to need updating. Um, I think that we need to do that in order to maintain a self safe and healthy environment, which um, not just for the residents, um, the household and yard, but it'll help uh, be a better basis for like schools, business and commerce by being a more attractive community as well. Um, I have been on the fence on this, uh, on the direction that it was. Um, I did miss the uh, uh, meeting about it, um, and was uh, disappointed uh, that I did miss it. I was looking for a little more opportunity to research it. Um, but as long as it is uh, the way that it seems to be uh, directed and used in that manner, um, I say that it's something very positive. Jordan? Yeah, with LB 357, I'm, I'm totally supportive of the, of the, uh, of the bill um, and the ballot initiative. With sales tax, sales tax is, is, in my opinion, is one of the most fairest taxes out there because as citizens of any community that comes into the city of Scottsdale, if you're going to make a choice on what you buy and, and if you are able to get taxed. We do have aging infrastructure. I've seen that in the last four years that I've been on the city council. Um, Roads, um, sewer, wastewater, um, sidewalks, um, it is not cheap. Um, and for us to continue to move forward and, and to continue to develop our infrastructure and upgrade, this sales tax will help with that. So, so I am supportive of it. Terry? I'm as well supportive of LB 357, and I will 
say to ditto kind of what Jordan said, it is the fairest tax out there. It as well generates a revenue for the city of Scotts Bluff to help out with the infrastructure, which is primarily, if you look, um, what it's focused on. Um, the, this last week, I, my wife had me out running around um, doing some shopping, and as I was out, walk, uh, out shopping, I looked at license plates on the vehicle. I seen 61 county plates. I seen Goshen county plates. I seen 39 county plates. Those people are still driving on our roads, and they're still using our infrastructure. Now they're coming in and assisting within our sales tax to help rebuild our infrastructure and then you know we're going to get into the on down the line the parks the aquatic center and i'll further into that at this point joanne yes um i echo that i am also for uh, lb 357. Uh, i feel that it's a shared tax for those who use our community and it's not just a burden on the citizens of Scotts Bluff like a property tax would be our aging infrastructure and other projects that we want to fund you know we've heard about the aquatic center and there's private investors um, those people would come here for events and things like that and bring in a half cent might not seem like a lot but it is if you increase the volume of people that are paying that tax so I think it like Jordan said it's the most fair tax we're not burdening property owners, um, which has a, a, a huge ripple effect on those not only who own the property but who rent properties, and uh, could price some people out of, of housing. So I feel it is a fair tax, and I hope that everybody will consider and read a little bit more if they're not sure, or feel free to ask people questions that have an, uh, more information about it. Thank you. Jeannie? Uh, yes, I'm also for the LB um, 357. Um, I agree that it is a shared burden, which is um, the best for the taxpayers. Um, I think that if we want to continue to grow our community, that we need to replace some of the infrastructure and um, uh, do some of these necessary um, construction projects and that to bring in more um, people to our community and grow it. So yes, I am for it. Any rebuttal at all? Okay. Next question is from Brad Stamen and Jordan, you'll be first to respond. There's been a great deal of uh, talk, both pro and con, about the proposed aquatic center. What are your thoughts about the aquatic center and the role that the city should play in, uh, in it? Sure, I, I think that's a very fair question. With the aquatic center, in my mind, the understanding is the aquatic center is something that is a later feature when we get the roads and the wastewater and the infrastructure up to date. The, the aquatic center is being, being really ran by another organization, but when, they, when it talks about partnerships, they want to partner with communities. I think it's a great idea. One thing that uh, I look at is being proactive in the city council. And so if we, if we talk about our current pool on Avenue I, we know that that pool is not going to last forever. And so we need to plan ahead on what our next steps are for that pool. Um, and when that infrastructure is costing us a lot of money to repair, the questions are going to come, what's next? And so I think that we really need to be proactive. And so my approach is, is that this is something that we can develop into a new indoor aquatic center, if you will, with an outdoor option. Um, very high level still, nothing is set in stone. That's something that I think that we need to look at proactively. So I don't think that, uh, from, my, from my understanding, that the city wants to be into any kind of uh, shape to, uh, to run it, the aquatic center. Jerry? 
I will agree with Jordan on the proactive aspect by all means. Um, we do need to, you know, take a look at this, be conscientious of this, but we've got to be as well conscientious of a budget aspect. Um, from a budget aspect, we, the past city council has chose to remove themselves from the splash arena. Uh, because of what the cost of the facility was costing the budget of the city of Scotts Bluff and the citizens. Um, LB 357 will play a role with, within this if it is passed. Um, you got to also take a look at the value and we do need to, in order to keep our kids living within this community, wanting to stay within this community, or bring other families and children into this community, we've got to invest within the community as well. Joanne? I agree. Um, that is a concept right now. Uh, so the devil's in the details. So I wouldn't be able to say until there's, it's mapped out and going more toward production, um, what the city's responsibility should be. I, I do feel that the city should not be running it, but to partner in some way. Maybe that will be through funding and it'll be 357 funds. Um, I am concerned uh, that it's not, education is extremely important, but a part of education and scholarship availability is sports, and we have some great uh, participating students and family members in swimming and um, I think that this would be a huge loss if we don't have the availability and I know that some people have considered moving out of the area to take their children to um, places where they can exceed in sports as well as academics that's a well-rounded student and um, scholar so I think you know in concept it's a great idea I would have to see more details before I could commit any details to that but I really feel that we need to explore these kind of options and partner with private uh, entities that um, are stepping up and saying that they would fund a lot of this and manage it. Jane? Uh, yes, I, you know, I think that the city um, uh, should actually partner with the private group that is um, that is, has this concept going, especially with their uh, swimming pools that are going down at this time. And, um, you know, what a, what better way to grow our sales tax revenues? It's not uncommon for any of us families to drive three, three and a half hours to a location that has an aquatic center, spend the weekend, spend money at hotels, restaurants, shopping. Um, so I don't think that it's something that they should manage. Um, but I think it would be a good concept for them to partner with um, these private individuals. Nathan? I'm a little biased because I actually grew up with a neighborhood pool two blocks from my house in Omaha. I didn't have to cross the street. I was a pool rat. I think swimming is highly important in this area. I believe that at one time it was a requirement for graduation that you had to have swimming abilities. I don't know if that's been taken off the uh, requirements at this point. Partnerships, we haven't done so well with in the past. So that's the part that worries me a little bit. The location is another one. It seems that we already have three swimming pools, well, not a splash pad, but a swimming pool along the river. I'd like to see maybe some different options. We're into looking for different options for dumps and whatnot. So why not take a look at some different options? Uh, maybe up at the college, get a college swim team going as well, draw more students to our community. Um, I can see it being used as a full-on park and rec center. Maybe add some basketball courts or volleyball courts, volleyball courts, not to compete against anybody, to give it a city uh, facility. It could be a great funding source. Growing up, I competed as a little elementary school kid in the Mayor's Challenge, where the mayor uh, would host different neighborhood pools and have competitions. I served on as the uh, Vice President of the Greater Omaha Swim League from everything from the little 12th uh, swimmer uh, clubs to the, the uh, country clubs as well. 
um, community that can be done there, and I also see how the two training centers being utilized by adults as well uh, for greater things. All right, uh, next question is from Brian, and Terry will be first. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, good to talk. I, I would like to touch the base on partnerships. Okay, Partners, go ahead. Partnerships I didn't touch on covers with not just private sector, but it also covers with our surrounding communities as well. And then I would also like to touch on the aquatic center with the health aspect of it. Um, and this is going to go in conjunction with our pathways, which citizens wanted years ago um, within the strategic planning. Anybody else want to say anything in regards to this issue? All right. Now Brian will ask the first question, and Terry will be in. What do you think can or should be done to shore up declining city revenues? Well, obviously, LB 357 is going to be in the assistance of that. Um, you know, we we do we are the third lowest um, in, in the state with our uh, tax levy as far as the city municipality goes. Um, in order to shore up the revenues, we have to bring people in here. We have to increase the economy. We can't 100% sit there and survive off of the ag economy. We know the ag economy is struggling right now. And with that being said, we've got to bring business into this area. Small business, and, and not only just bring business into this area, big business such as prime metals, um, got to support the existing businesses that are already established within this community, also. Joanne? Um, I agree. We have to support local businesses and we have to bring uh, new businesses in. And I think that. Um, Star Wheel is doing a great job with bringing visitors to the area to show show them what we have to offer. I think, um, who would have thought we had a zoo when I came here? We have a zoo. And um, different entities, businesses um, have their employee picnics there. And it wouldn't be unusual to drive a couple of hours to get to a zoo. We have a new exhibit with bears. Um, and that's, that's been promoted. And there's been fundraising done. I think, I think that along with other attractive things that we have here and we hope to have, um, will bring people from the outside in. I think the, sh the tourism could increase and we could certainly work on that more. And Nebraska's not for everyone, but it is for a lot of people and there's a lot of things to do here. Um, so I think supporting local businesses as well as encouraging and trying to assist financially new businesses, small businesses that want to come here. Jeannie, you're next. Uh, I just want to say that I don't believe that OB uh, 357 funds can be used for like the general operating funds that would be separate just for those projects we've identified so I did want to bring that up um, so that would be an increase for our tax revenues um, I think that we need to focus as well on our existing businesses and help them grow as well as bring in new and part of that is um, we need to partner with some of the schools uh, locally now that we have the career academies we can help um, train and grow our youth into different jobs uh, through the internship programs um, the company I work for now we have four students and they've been great and um, this will attract new businesses and I know I've sat on the LBA 40 review committee and that has been something that the new businesses have talked about is partnering with those people um, so I think that's very important. I think we need to partner with our other municipalities in the area. Um, may it be city of Terrytown, city of Gearing, you know, just to create some efficiencies as well. So, Nathan, I apologize. Before you start my time, could you repeat the question? I kind of got lost in translation there. I apologize. I don't even remember. That's all right. <laughs> okay. 
what do you think can or should be done to shore up declining city revenues? Okay. Uh, after listening to everybody's answer, I started being steered in the same direction as well, just making sure that I was understanding your question. Uh, the last time I was at one of these uh, forums, there were similar questions about how are we going to bring in new business, new retail. Um, you know, that was what, four years ago, and I see we're coming up against it again. We've got a mall that's kind of in decline right now, hopefully turning around. Um, Broadway, we put a lot of money into to hopefully keep those small businesses there. Um, I, I would hope that we do our best to bring in different career opportunities, not rely upon retail as the only way to bring in retail dollars, but bringing in more residents that would utilize those retail sources um, to help us. So by growing the community, I'd love to see us grow by a thousand people in the next four years. I know that doesn't seem like a lot, but it's pretty huge. Um, I, I would love to see more um, use of the college um, in bringing in different uh, career aspects or seeing what the kids are actually, kids that's uh, consulting to the college students I can mean, uh, what their interests are and why they're going to school to do what. Because looking around, if they wanted to be an astronaut, obviously we're not going to go to Scott's Bluff uh, Air and Space Museum here. But what, what opportunities do we have and can we create to bring the population in? Those taxes at the different retail sites. Jordan? If we're talking about shoring uh, up of declining revenues, I, I think I, first I want to start out by saying that the city has done a, the last four years and longer have reclassified positions, have looked at positions before they hire and have waited to fill certain positions. So um, that's one way that the, that, um, the city's been diligent about what, what, they, what they need. Um, also streamlining processes, streamlining some of the workflows. Um, a good example would be like our central garage right now. What we do, we used to send out some of our vehicles out to get maintenance and uh, on the vehicles. And now we have a central garage where our vehicles can go into the central garage and we have employees work on those for some of those general maintenance that we used to send out. So that was just the one way that we streamlined the approach to try to save some of our money. We always have to work within a balanced budget the LB 357 is a tool that we would like to use, um, but let's not let's not get the get it wrong by saying that it's the end all be all. We still have uh, a five and six and ten year plan for roads. It's just how fast do we want to get those the infrastructure updated. We we'll always want to increase economic development with businesses and continue to develop, continue to improve entrepreneurship in the area. We have a great school system here. We have a great college. We'll continue to work on those partnerships. But if we're talking about shoring up declining revenues, then the city is, is doing a, a good job, in my opinion, of that now, and we'll continue. Anybody want a chance for a rebuttal there? All right, Scott has the next question, and Joanne, you're first this time. What should be the city's role with regard to the Riverside Discovery Center, especially continue? Well, that's a tough one. Um, I think that the opportunity is there to bring back that revenue plus if it's marketed the right way and if we bring people in from other areas for other events and things like that. Um, I think that the community depends on it. I think that it is a great asset. Um, it's a tourism tool that we can use. Um, it's hard for me to project how much it would make, but I know that if we increase tourism, if we increase the uh, economic growth in the area and bring other people in, that zoo also, people do drive um, from two and three hours away to come to the zoo. If you just look at their, their log book and, and where people come from, the majority of people come from um, out of town also. But local um, businesses have events there. It's a, it's a forum for that and it's it's a great family event. The hospital had their picnic there and it was open to everyone, employees and families, and it, it, was, it was monumental. People got to come for free because the hospital paid for this. People that probably couldn't afford it with four and five children at the time. So more events like that uh, I think would promote the zoo. Um, I just think it's an asset that we wouldn't want to lose right now. So funding, um, we'd have to, to, to look at that. What would we lose by refusing to fund that? I think we'd lose a lot. 
Jean? Um, I do believe the zoo is an asset. Um, my understanding is, is that the city has helped fund it to get it to the point of being self-sustaining. And uh, their revenues have grown over the past years, but not enough where they could um, carry on on their own. So I think that the city may still have to have a role in um, the zoo going forward. I think they need to um, continue to scale back and um, try to get it up and running on its own, but they probably will still have a role going forward. Nathan? I think the zoo is looking to stand alone. I think they have different requirements um, that they do need the solid uh, a solid commitment from our city in order to meet those goals. Um, I know in years past, the zoo city uh, didn't have the best, uh, left, left kind of a little sour taste in the mouth on what are we actually paying for and what are we getting. I've seen Anthony do great things and, and uh, I'm a little biased in the fact that my little Cub Scout group actually carved over 100 pumpkins one night just to put out for the spectacular and uh, got to know some of the employees and volunteers there, uh, probably a little bit more, uh, and being able to just say, oh, I've been to the zoo and I saw the animals, I feel a little bit apart, even though I'm not a, a member. I pay my daily fees when I go in there. Um, but they do have a splash pad, which is fun for the kids. Um, you know, not a pool. Um, and it's fun to go to to wash your feet off in case you got a little uh, peacock uh, droppings or something on too. It's a little funny. Um, I, I think that they do need our backing to be more successful. And when they have an opportunity to be able to rely on us to expand, uh, kind of at a moment's notice, so they do better. Jordan? Yeah, I think um, with the Riverside Discovery Center and Anthony Mason, he's, he's doing great things there. Um, the new bear exhibit that he's trying to raise money for and campaigning their um, school programs, that, or not school, but um, uh, preschool and programs that they have there on Wednesdays. I just saw that they're elaborating on a, on a new program and expanding for, for uh, the homeschooled children. So he really has a goal in mind to get out there to the community and do a lot of community outreach. I think partnerships, not only with the city of Scottsbluff, but outside partnerships. For example, I, I thought one day, you know, why why couldn't the zoo uh, contact the Henry Dorley or the Denver Zoo to see if there is some partner, partnership that they can do? For example, Anthony um, interned at the Omaha Zoo, and actually we received some of their animals here, um, and so. My thought is, is could we partner in a way that we're a research facility or a lab or something to bring a draw out here? But I believe that the city partnership with the zoo is important, and I think Anthony needs a chance to uh, to get it running on its own. Terry, I just recently went to the zoo for the first time in probably 15 to 20 years. And the last time I was there, I was like, man, what a dump. With that being said, looking at the city budget and stuff, and I seen the price tag on the zoo at $350,000 to operate that, that is why I went to meet with Anthony at the zoo, was to see to what the changes had been done and what changes that have been made. And I was extremely impressed. This zoo is a top quality zoo and is only growing farther and forward. Um, the bear exhibit, I seen the chart with what has been raised outside of city tax dollars. It was like $125,000 for a $500,000 project. Um, have an outside resource that's coming in and working on the chim chimpanzee exhibit. Um, it, it was clean. It was, uh, the pathways was wonderful. This is middle of the morning and there was all kinds of families there middle of the week. I, I was very, very impressed. And that zoo is great for this community. 
Any rebuttal at all? Nathan? I forgot how much time I have, so I'm going to go quick here. I think that the zoo is an excellent example of occupational expansion. It gives uh, a look at different careers that are not normally seen in cities our size. Uh, the events that they host to bring people in, put uh, people in beds at hotels, is a wonderful teaching and educational place as well. Um, it does require more than one day to go through and see everything. So with that being said, people do go back. You, it's not something where you can just breeze by in a couple hours. Um, and it does keep you uh, motivated. And I am not sponsored by the zoo at all, what I'm saying here. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, Brad. Let me ask uh, our moderator: How much more time do we have? None. Well, I don't know. Supposedly <laughs> none. Oh, but yeah. if you have a question you really like to ask, go ahead. We have two more questions on our list here. Um, I'll just keep in the order that we've got listed here. Um, right now, we do not have a city planner or a park director on our payroll. Should these positions be filled? If so, why? If not, why? Jeannie, you're first. <laughs> um, I think a city planner is important. I think that would help to um, grow our community. I'm not sure why. I can't speak to why they don't have one at this time other than probably budget constraints. But I think that would be an important role to help us um, grow here locally, so. Nathan? Oh, um, that is a, a direction that the council will have to take up with the city manager. Um, you know, it is important in this election to know that we need to elect a diverse team, the ability to think independently about these different issues. Um, and we need to have meaningful conversation. Individuals, we need to understand the scope of office to be able to place the city of Scott's Bluff for personal bias or agenda. And it is our guidance of the city manager uh, and other non-elected appointments uh, that the citizens have a say in this. Um, so I would put this back to Nathan and say, how can we better plan, give direction for the city manager as far as the partner director? If we have a pool that has a recreation facility with it, absolutely, I think there should be a director in that. If we're not going to do it, why do we have a director for mowing lawns and parks? I mean, it, it has to stand for something. Jordan? Yeah, I, I first want to clarify, there are people taking care of the parks and the rec. Uh, <laughs> we, we do have a park supervisor. Uh, but no parks director, no right? Parks, no, okay. no parks director. But this is a, an example of a reclassification of a job duty where we were able to streamline and be able to give some of the responsibilities throughout to other employees. As far as the city planner, that's another example of a streamlined approach and looking at contracts that we have with other outside organizations that provide the planning for us already. So um, a question, just like you have had with the park supervisor and city planner and, and Nathan have pointed out, to go back to the city manager and to say, are, are we getting what we need um, from those outside contracted organizations? And is the park supervisor and the other people and, the, and other employees uh, performing to the highest that they can? And, and are there things that they're missing? Um, I, I have not heard that. Um, and from when I had the conversation with him on the city planner, uh, he believes that um, he's getting what he needs uh, in order to uh, to move the, the, the city forward. So at this time, um, I don't believe that we need a city planner on staff. Terry? I'm going to keep things real simple. <laughs> because Jordan really actually said it best. No, I don't think we need either one of those positions filled. And the reason being is with the shortfall in revenue uh, from sales tax and stuff this last year, um, we had to cut somewhere. And if the position was not there and not filled, that's a way to cut in the budget. Joanne? Um, I agree with Jordan and others. I, I think that in today's 
industry world, everyone's looking at a, a leaner approach. Um, do we have somebody that can take on parts of a job? Are we, do we have redundancy? Um, not everybody needs to function at a director level. Um, the city manager was tasked with balancing the budget. That was not an easy task. I, I, I was awake just worrying about him. Um, but he did a great job. You can't have everything that everybody wants, just like in your household. You have to prioritize and choose, and how can we best provide the services with what we have. Um, that's always a challenge in, in business and in your personal life. I think that Nathan um, does feel that he receives what he needs, and until that would change, or we would have to drill down into a certain aspect, but to just say we need a, a director of parks and recreation or a city planner, I'm not sure we do. I think that we've made great strides with what we have and how it's been redistributed. So I don't think we're going without anything. Any rebuttal by anybody? Okay. All right, Brian, you have the last question. Okay. And Nathan, your first response. Do you believe the city's involvement in the Gearing Industrial Park is proper, and what else may be done to? Time's been up five minutes ago. <laughs> I <agree>. Started <laughs> <laughs> Well, I live in Scotts Bluff. I would like to see more things come to Scotts Bluff. I remember when I moved here eight years ago, it was Scotts Bluff and Gearing. The partnership came there and then it became the Sugar Valley. We included many other communities. And now I hear it being referred to as Gearing Valley. Same part. Have we shifted all the